Section 17 of A Dozen Ways of Love by Lily Dugall A Freak of Cupid, Chapter 1 The earth was white, the firmament was white, the plumage of the wind was white. The wind flew between curling drift and falling cloud, brushing all comers with its feathers of light, dry snow. At the sides of the road, the posts and bars of log fences stood above the drifts. On the side of the hill, the naked maple trees formed a soft bush of gray, just in sight and no more. The white tin roof and gray walls of a huge church in a small village were visible. All else was unbroken snow. The surface of an ice-covered lake, the sloping fields, the long straight road between the fences were as pure in their far-reaching whiteness as the upper levels of some cloud in shadeless air. A young Englishman was traveling alone through this region. He had set out from the village and was about to cross the lake. A shaggy pony, a small sleigh, a couple of buffalo robes, and a portmanteau formed his whole equipment. The snow was light and dry. The pony trotted, although the road was soft. The young man, wrapped in his fur-lined coat, had little to do in driving. In England, no one would set out in such a storm, but this traveler had learned that in Canada the snowy vast is regarded as a plaything, or a good medium of transit, or at the worst, an encumbrance to be plodded through as one plods through the storms of rain. He had found that he was not expected to remain at inn merely because it snowed, and, being a man of spirit, he had on this day, as on others, done what was expected of him. Today, in the snow and wind, there was a slight difference from the storms of other days. The innkeeper, who had given him his horse an hour before by the walls of the great tin-roofed church, had looked at the sky and the snow, and asked if he knew the road well, but this had been accepted as an ignorant distrust of the foreign gentleman. Having learned his lesson, that through falling snow he must travel, into the heart of this greater snowstorm he traveled, valiant, if somewhat doubtful. When he descended upon the ice of the lake, he was no longer accompanied by the gray length of log fences. This road across the lake had been well tracked after the former snowfalls, and so the untrodden snow rose high on either sides. Branches of fir and cedar, stuck at short intervals at these snow walls, marked out the way. The pony ceased to trot. The driver was only astonished that this cessation of speed had not come sooner. Standing up in his sleigh and looking round, he could see two or three other sleighs traveling across near the village. The village he could no longer see, scarcely even the hill, nor was there any communication over the deep untrodden snow between his road and that other on which there were travelers. Another hour passed, and now, as he went on slowly up the length of the lake, all sound and sight of other sleighs were lost. The cloud was not dark. The snow fell in such small flakes that it did not seem that even an infinite number of them could bury the world. The wind drifting them together, though strong, was not boisterous. The March evening did not soon darken, and yet there was something in the determined action of cloud and wind and snow, making the certainty that night would come with no abatement, which caused even the inexperienced Englishman to perceive that he was passing into the midst of a heavy storm. As is frequently the case with travelers, he had certain directions concerning the road which appeared to be adequate, until he was actually confronted with that small portion of the earth's surface to which it was necessary to apply them. He was to take the first road which crossed his, running from side to side of the lake, but the first cross track appeared to him so narrow and so deeply drifted that he did not believe it to be the public road he sought. Some farm, hidden in the level maple bush just seen through the falling snow, sends an occasional cart to the village by this bypath. So he reassured himself, and the pony, who had spied the track first and paused to have time to consider it, at the word of command obediently plotted its continuous route. A quarter of a mile farther on, the traveler saw something in the road in front, as the sound of his pony's jangling bells approached. A horse lifted its head and shook its own bells, the horse, the sleigh which it ought to have been drawing, were standing still, full in the center of the road. The first thought, that it was cheering to come up on the trace of another wayfarer, was checked by the gloomy idea that some impassable drift must bar the way. 
The other sleigh was a rough wooden platform on runners. Upon it, a man, wrapped in a ragged buffalo skin, lay prostrate. The Englishman jumped to the ground and waited till he could lay his hand upon the recumbent figure. At a touch, the man jumped fiercely and shook himself from sleep. Warm, luxurious sleep, only that, seemed to have enthralled him. His cheeks were red, his aquiline nose, red also, suggested some amount of strong drink, but his black eyes were bright, showing that the senses were wholly alive. He looked defiant, inquiring. He was a French-Canadian, apparently a habitant, but he understood the English questions addressed to him. The curious thing was that he seemed to have no reason for stopping. When he had with difficulty made way for the gentleman to pass him on the road, he followed slowly, as it seemed reluctantly. A mile farther on, the Englishman, now far in front, suspected that the other had again stopped, and wondered much. The man's face had impressed him. His high cheekbones, the aquiline nose, the clearness of the eye and complexion, these had not expressed dull folly. Now the Englishman came to another crossroad, wider but more deeply drifted than the track he was on. He turned into it and plowed the drifts. When he reached the shore, where the land undulated, the drifts were still deeper. There were no trees here. He could see no house. There was hardly any evidence, except the evergreen branches stuck in the sides, that the road had ever been trodden. The March dusk had now fallen, yet not darkly. The full moon was beyond the clouds, and whatever wave of light came from declining day or rising night was held in by, and reflected slothfully from, the storm of pearl. After some debate he turned back to the lake in his former road. It must lead somewhere. He pressed steadily on toward the western end of the lake. The western shore was level. He hardly knew when he was upon the land. The glimmering night blinded the traveler. No ray of candlelight was in sight. He began to think that he was destined to see his horse slowly buried and himself to fight, as long as might be, a losing battle with the fiends of the air. At last the plodding pony stopped again resolutely. Long lines of Lombardy poplars here met the road. They were but as the ghosts of trees. Their stately shape, their regular succession, inspired him with some sentiment of romance which he did not stay to define. He dimly discerned shrubs, as if planted in a pleasure ground. Wading and fumbling he found a paling and a gate. The pony turned off the high road with renewed courage in its motion. The Englishman, Letting loose the rein, found himself drawn slowly up a long avenue of ghostly poplar trees. The road was straight, the land was flat, the poplars were upright. The simplicity affected him with the notion that he was coming to an enchanted palace. The pony approached the door of a large house, dim to the sight. Its huge pointed tin roof, its stone sides, mantled as they were with snowflakes and fringed with icicles at eaves and lintels, hardly gave a dark outline and the glimmering storm. The rays of light which twinkled through chinks of shutters might be analogous to the stars produced by a stunned brain. It seemed to the Englishman that if he went up and tried to knock on the door, the ghostly house, the ghostly poplar avenue, would vanish. The thought was born of the long monotony of a danger which had called for no activity of brain or muscle on his part. The pony knew better. It stopped before the door. The traveler stood in a small porch raised a step or two from the ground. The door was opened by a middle-aged Frenchwoman clad in a peasant's gown of bluish gray. Behind her, holding a lamp a little above her head, stood a young girl, large, womanly in form, with dimpled softness of face, and dressed in a rich but quaint garment of amber color. With raised and statuesque wrist, she held the lamp aloft to keep the light from dazzling her eyes. She was looking through the doorway with a quiet interest of responsibility, nothing of which was expressed in the servant's furrowed countenance. Is the master of the house at home? There is no master. The girl spoke with a mellow voice and with a manner of soft dignity, yet, having regarded the stranger, there leaped into her face, as it seemed to him, behind the outward calm of the dark eyes and dimpling curves, a certain excited interest and delight. The current of thought thus revealed contrasted with the calm which she instinctively turned to him, as the words which an actor speaks aside contrast with those which are not soliloquy. 
With more hesitation, more obvious modesty, he said, May I speak to the mistress of the house? I am the mistress. He could not but look upon her more intently. She could not have been more than eighteen years of age. Her hair had the soft and loose manner of lying upon her head that is often seen in hair which has, till lately, been allowed to hang loose to the winds. Her dress, folded over the bosom and sweeping to the ground in ample curves, was, little as he could have described a modern fashion, even to his eyes evidently fantastic, such as a child might don at play. Above all, as evidence of her youth, there was that inward quiver of delight at his appearance and presence, veiled perfectly, but seen behind the veil, as one may detect glee rising in the heart of a child, even though it be upon its formal behavior. Can you tell me if there is any house within reach where I can stop for the night? He gave a succinct account of his journey, the lost road, the increasing storm. My horse is dead tired, but it might go a mile or so farther. The serving woman, evincing some little curiosity, received from the girl an interpretation in low, rapid French. The woman expressed by her gestures some pity for man and beast. The girl replied with gentle brevity, We know that the roads are snowed up. The next house is three miles farther on. He hesitated, but his necessity was obvious. I am afraid I must beg for a night's shelter. He had been wondering a good deal what she would say, how she would accede, and then he perceived that her dignity knew no circumlocution. I will send the man for your horse. She said it with hardly a moment's pause. The woman gave him a small broom, an implement to the use of which he had grown accustomed, and disappeared upon the errand. The girl stood in her statuesque pose of light-bearer. The young man busied himself in brushing the snow from cap, coats, and boots. As he brushed himself, he felt elation in the knowledge, not ordinarily uppermost, that he was a good-looking fellow and a gentleman. End of chapter 1